Hello and welcome to the Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Somme Sambu. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, 60 minutes, I beg your pardon, after months of delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the historic African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement launches. But according to analysts, full implementation of the historic pact may take years. The new trade policy aims to bring together 1.3 billion people in a $3.4 trillion economic block that will be the largest free trade area since the establishment of the World Trade Organization. And the key question is, how can Nigeria and other African countries avoid becoming a dumping ground for goods as a result of the new trade policy? And later, the control of the U.S. Senate and the fate of the Biden presidency is on the line in a pair of runoff races happening in the state of Georgia. According to correspondents, if the Democrats win both races, the president-elect will gain a big opportunity to build a progressive legacy. If Democrats lose one or both races, the country will enter at least two years of divided government. Would President Trump's audio of him pressuring Georgia's top election official to overturn his election defeat affect Georgia's Senate election? We have analysis coming up. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement was meant to be launched on July 1, 2020, but was pushed back after the coronavirus pandemic made in-person negotiations impossible. The World Bank estimates it could lift tens of millions out of poverty by 2035, and it will boost trade among African neighbors, allowing the continent to develop its value chain. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed Africa's over-reliance on the export of primary commodities and global supply chains. All African countries except Eritrea have signed on the AFCFTA framework agreement with 34 ratifying it. With the policy coming into effect on January 1, African leaders say the real work begins now. Trading amongst ourselves will be duty-free and quota-free. And with a market of some 1.2 billion people and a combined GDP of some 3 trillion United States dollars, the AFCFTA will boost inter-African trade, stimulate investment and innovation, diversify exports, improve food security, foster structural transformation, enhance economic growth, and above all, provide jobs for the youth, as well as fresh impetus for African entrepreneurs. Indeed, the focus of our trade agreement should be directed to a larger extent on the development and sustaining small and medium enterprises, and not only on well-established big companies. During our extraordinary summit a few weeks ago, I made an appeal to my counterparts for a protocol on women in trade as part of the many protocols that must be concluded as part of our free trade agreement. If we are to make the financial inclusion of women a reality, we must start to turn our commitments into action for the benefit of the women of our beloved continent. As we usher in a new era of trade and economic development on our continent, we should not lose sight of our common priority of silence well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Professor Ken Ife, who's a macroeconomic policy analyst, and joining us via WebEx from Accra, Ghana, is Kwasi Amposa Boateng, a businessman with interest in the extractive industry, oil, gas, and mining. Good to have you, gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, let's start with you, Prof. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, here with us, the AFCFTA, and uh, the fears among those countries with huge population, huge markets, like Nigeria, Ethiopia, Egypt, and all of that, is that we may have a situation whereby cheap goods actually dumped 
into these countries and it becomes near difficult to push them out or to regulate them easily. What are your thoughts? Well, Nigeria is not scared. They're, we're actually happy that we're going into this arrangement because we've been on the ECOWAS arrangement, free trade area, for how many years? Over 40 years. But the thing is, there is something that AFCTA offers us that is still an advantage you know, in, that, in the area of free trade. Because free trade is just one stage. There is common market next stage, and then there's single currency economic union next. So we've gone very, very far in ECOWAS. So this is a starting point for the Africa continental uh, uh, stage. But one thing I have to say, though, is that Nigeria is concerned, and legitimately so, because of what you just said, the dumping of goods and the violation of protocols on, on, uh, on cross-border trade and all of that. Not that we don't want it. We, we want it. There are 90 million MSMEs in Africa. 45 million of them are from Nigeria. Half are from Nigeria. There are how many banks? Nigerian banks are in all over all the, all the countries. We, we are ready for the trade. In the same thing, ICT, we have 90 hubs. We are more than, so we are, and we're the biggest economy. So there's so much there for Nigeria. And you wouldn't expect Nigeria to continue to export raw cocoa to Europe and raw that, raw this. Are you going to export raw things to African countries? So this, some of that would have to stop because we will now have to start sourcing some of our raw materials from the continent. 80% of Nigerian manufacturing activities depend on imported raw materials. So it's an opportunity for us to look around and say, look, why don't we source these materials from local companies? Instruct our banks to support companies that are going to do deals to supply us industrial raw materials. So there's a scope for us to do well there. Uh, all right, let's go to you, Boateng. Um, it, it's, it's a critical thing for businessmen like you who conduct cross-border trade and all of that to actually ensure that this favors, uh, you know, whatever you do. But uh, uh, would you want to tell us the challenges that you hope to face as a businessman that does business within um, uh, uh, African countries? Do you think that the bureaucracy, for example, will be reduced? And what are the gains that you hope to actually have uh, during this implementation of the AFCFTA? I, I think that there's going to be a need for some policy reform. I mean, internally in some of our countries, but as uh, I heard from the previous speaker, the will to actually collaborate exists. One of the things that is going to really cause challenges as we move forward is our general rates of appreciation of each other's needs. I mean, Nigeria is a superpower. No one actually denies that in terms of economic. And the size of Nigeria's economy provides opportunities for neighboring economies to actually collaborate. And it's the collaboration that we want to emphasize. The difficulty in terms of our individual national policies, I think, will work itself out over time. And if we have collaboration at the head of our mind, we will get this done. by uh, 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 some officials who have said that some businessmen are actually saying that this AFCFTA will favor big businesses more than smaller businesses. I don't know the size of your business, but <laughs> how will this affect, uh, uh, affect you? Are you afraid of actually, you know, facing competition with your business, with uh, businessmen from Nigeria uh, uh, and other top African countries? It's opportunity that we should emphasize. I'm a small business compared to, I mean, what I would call a large scale multinational. The supply chains have opportunity. The subcontracting has opportunity. And it's how we actually collaborate to make these work within our laws and within our business behaviors. We have traditional and historical links that we must explore. We also have an opportunity to loosen our grip on the old technologies and adopt new technologies. I think that is what will make the so-called smaller businesses be able to compete with the larger businesses. The big game changer will be technology. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the fears, uh, for example, by Nigeria that uh, most of its neighbors are dominated by uh, uh, mostly uh, francophone countries actually and 
they get most of their goods coming from France and all of that, that look, a lot of goods that are manufactured more from France may get dumped into Nigeria because, you know, of uh, porous borders, lots of things like that. And for example, we have an issue in the ECOWAS region, which has been hitting us very hard. Most times, based on the ECOWAS protocols that we have, containers are meant for Nigeria, for example, as opposed to get to Togo, and then the Togolese customs officials will bring it to our borders, and they hand it over to our customs. But instead, we see the Togolese customs officials opening them and then asking our businessmen to pay tariffs there. Why haven't we been able to succeed in all of this? Well, that's part of the challenge. And I think one of the yes, uh, difficulties, actually, was that whilst most of our neighboring countries have implemented single window, national single window, Nigeria has not. And we are about to, you know, in this uh, budget year, we'll see so. And then secondly, we couldn't implement regional single window because we haven't. So others are ready for it. But I think the government is addressing that. Because if you fully implement that, there's no need to touch the container. Because before the container actually, if you're importing from London, you would have all your papers, everything would have been scrutinized, you would have paid your, everything before it actually enters the ship and starts going down. And then if you now cite your trajectory as going to uh, Tokunu, Kotunu and transiting or going to Accra, uh, uh, to Tema and then transiting from by road to Nigeria, then all the customs in the joint would have seen it in the manifest. So they, they, would, they don't have any need to do that. Because so all they just need to keep doing it. Correct. They keep forwarding it until all right. they get and to And then Nigeria. Nigeria would have received their money anyway, their tax. So this is, there would not be an incentive. But when that is a, is a system challenge, when that is implemented, that's fine. The second part of it is that we, they, they usually need to dump goods. And you mentioned that at the opening speech. When you dump, there are two things that you do. They tend to dump substandard goods that are injurious to the health of the country. Because they are not giving the opportunity for the statutory organizations like NAFDAQ and all that to actually inspect. You are dumping things that could kill people. The second one is that you, the smuggle, they don't pay the duty. So when Nigeria was forced into a border closure, we actually found out the size of the smuggling economy. That the customs were getting extra 5 to 7 billion naira every day extra from revenue. That's what they're actually losing from, from that illicit trade. And then, of course, you have the arms coming in. And then you have also drugs coming in. And then you suddenly, Nigeria is the biggest uh, meddler on, on, on drugs when we don't even produce drugs here. So when they investigated what was going on, where is this drug being consumed? They are consumed in theaters of war. So then that is actually extending the longevity of the war, the small arms experience. So all of this cost forced Nigeria to say, oh, wait a minute, let's, let's see the size of this operation and, and then and, and Nigeria closed and the, yeah that. of course of course but, but eventually of course, but eventually we'll opened it right now eventually eventually we all came back to all of us came back to our senses because ECOWAS has provided the, the, the cross-border protocols that have to be observed yeah and Nigeria you know, said those yeah. protocols were not, being, not observed. being observed that's why you know the Mwari insisted that yeah. until our neighbors actually follow those protocols in, I mean, it's collusion. It's collusion between border. businesses in Nigeria and the businesses across the border. It's collusion. Okay, Don't forget, from, there's one million just Nigerians in this in AFCFTA. Now, what will they really mean? Does it mean that with its implementation, it's going to be different from what we have seen with the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme, which we have seen over the years that have seen Nigeria's borders open? What does this mean? What does this <laughs> lead to our borders? Actually, how, how will our borders function under this regime? The, 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 the what let me tell you what it's not going to materially change what is the difficulties and challenges we're having in the borders because eventually the goods have to come through the borders one it has to come through the sea two it has to come by air three we don't have this challenge by air we don't have it by sea except that what happens the distortion we are having is because of the high cost of clearance in Nigerian seaports then those guys are having it easier to That's go and clear within 24 hours, 24 hours. And then also the problem is that they get asked to pay duty. And when they paid it once, they, they don't want to pay it twice. And then they start to find a way to bring it in, into the country, compounding the problem. But the advantage of the AFCTA is that we have a dispute resolution mechanism under the AFCTA. So you can go and complain. We couldn't, you know, as much on, under, the, yeah, under the ECOWAS regime. In fact, even the challenge we are having with Ghana, our, our businesses, we couldn't, we've taken it, our businesses have taken it to the COAS court 
and he says they don't have jurisdiction on trade. It's only human rights. <laughs> so, but now, yeah, you, you and, can and complain. And a lot of people have been asking then, what dispute mechanism will be put in place. No, the, it is. It is under, under AFCTA, there is. And also, there is some kind of pe penalty for violation, for cross-border violation. So, countries are now going to be hit with a bill. So, that, that's also helpful. And, um, and so many other features within the AFCTA that would make it, you know, that is also accompanied by free air. Okay, let's so, talk about the fears by smaller countries too, that uh, big yeah. businesses from Nigeria will just move into their countries and actually suffocate their markets. <laughs> I, I don't think it's founded. Let me tell you why it's not founded. In ECOWAS, we have free movement of goods and services. And those primary goods move freely all the agricultural produce, right, great, they move freely across the border. No duty, no charge. And that's been going on. It's only when you come to processed goods, you now have to, you pay duty on those, unless you register for ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme. Now, that liberalization scheme has a rule of origin in it, where you have to demonstrate at least 30% value addition. And then, of course, you have to register as a company, register the products, and then you register your capacity under that. One of the challenges when I was doing the trade facilitation uh, under the WTO trade facilitation in 2011, we went to visit all the borders. And they told us that the neighboring com the companies across the border that registered, they have their record of how much capacity they have. So they have already imported into Nigeria four times the capacity that they have declared, which means they get things from somewhere and they just <laughs> ship it over. <laughs> <laughs> See the point? So they now insist that they will go and visit their factory each time they are bringing an import. So these are some of the challenges, but these things are like less likely to happen now under AFCTA. Okay, uh, we'll just have to move on to Ghana right now, uh, where we still have Boateng with us. Now, let's talk about tariffs. How do you expect uh, countries to handle the issues of tariffs that have been removed and all of that? Are there still little payments that businesses uh, like yours would have to be paying? And then uh, what kind of fillers are you receiving from countries that you have been uh, engaging in business with? period. Some of the tariffs are well documented. Uh, our customs authorities are very capable. There is a level of, I think, misunderstanding sometimes, and uh, it's to do with our appreciation of what rules we are all abiding by. You know, as individual countries, we are very used to behaving in particular ways. And I believe that those small tariffs will still have to be paid. The real crush would be around where there are substantive sort of permits around tax alleviation, especially when it's really going to impact smaller businesses, say, for instance, in Ghana. Let me give you a very simple example that might illustrate it. The production of starch. You know, a lot of industries produce starch, but currently there's a lot of importation of staff outside our free trade area. And it is at such a reduced and cheap cost that producing starch locally becomes a very difficult one. But for instance, should I get into partnership with somebody in, say, a large economy like Nigeria to produce starch, we should be able to agree to have the volumes that will begin to make it much better for us to import the starch from Nigeria than from another country outside our free trade zone area. And I think that is where the real synergies will begin to happen. When we begin to see that it will shorten the value chain, it will bring advantages to our individual countries within the free zone area. And subsequently, I think water will find its own level. Because if your costs are very high, anyone who has cheaper goods and is not protected will beat you in terms of price. And the normal trade arrangement is people want value for money. So I think it's those niggling, teething, transitionary arrangements that we will have to actually work between each other and see ourselves as trading partners, not as competitors. Partners are not competitors. Uh, thanks. Let's come to you, Prof. Uh, we have a market of 1.3 billion people and uh, a proposed economic block of 3.4 trillion US dollars, making it the largest in the world after the WTO. How can um, African businesses tap into this market to make this a reality? We know it cannot be achieved just in a year, 
But over the years, within the span of 10 years, by 2030, how do you foresee this trade block uh, becoming? First of all, we need to allow technology to take its place because technology has become a defining instrument uh, for, for all sectors of the, of, the, of the economy. So that has to play a central role. But i tell you something else. You know, the experiment we started in ECOWAS, which was now taken over by our Frexim Bank to, to look at cross-border payment system, you know, because it's going to be a long way to look at a single uh, currency. We're still struggling with it in, our, in West Africa. If the 10 convergence criteria, we are all at different stages in that. So take it alone when 54 countries are doing that. Now, that will make a difference because the, the, to go through a letter of credit, you have to go through dollar. And that, that adds another 20%. And that's and the then cost you, of it will add about twenty percent or more on the cost of, of, of the thing. But you remove that if we if we have a, a, a cross border payment system, settlement system, then that removes that. And that is gain. That will help in bringing down making our products far more competitive. We also have infrastructure challenge that is really horrendous. You know, from Nigerian point of view, transport adds twenty percent to input costs. Power has 30% to input cost. And when you add that, only two items giving you 50%, it's going to be difficult to compete. But then, when you now look at transit corridors across Africa, Lamu Corridor and the Mombasa Corridor already hitting uh, Cameroon and crossing to Nigeria to join the, the coastal, that, that is a game changer in, in many respects because you're now going to knock down the cost of transportation. The second part, part of it is the cost of freight. Freight, freight services. Now, when containers come in, it's supposed to be $1,500 to come from Europe, America to Nigeria or Ghana. It's supposed to be $1,500 to get to Kenya. But because we are sending in empty containers that cost only $500, we don't have the backhaul capacity. So you now end up paying $2,500, and then the other $500 is to, because it's, you're not you're healthy. Now, you will not have that problem of backhaul capacity when you, are, when you have huge hubs in West Africa and huge hub in, in India, and, and then, sorry, in um, East Africa, and then you have the interconnection rail. So that, that disappears. You don't have to have shipment go all the way to South Africa and come up again. So the, the location of uh, Mombasa is the closest and cheapest import Very bill from, uh, from India, from Japan, from all that area, while our coast is nearest to Europe, uh, uh, South America, North America, Canada. So the, the huge economy there. Then the power, India, India 1 and 2 of Congo is producing 40,000 megawatts. South Africa is taking about 25. They don't need 10,000 megawatts. Nigeria can take 10,000 megawatts from them. And ah, that's from the DR is, uh, bringing the Of course. <laughs> building the G yeah, so you can see how that will change the dynamics. Because with our 5,000 megawatts, of course, we have a plan to go up. But that coming in will change the, will, will double the size of the economy. So, for example, the Renaissance Dam in uh, Ethiopia yeah, will come that, from that's, that's, that's huge. So that's huge. They push uh, power. They will enter into the power up. pool. And that will be a game changer for the processing capacity of Africa. Uh, okay, but 10, if you are still with us, um, I would want to ask how you would advise uh, smaller businesses to tap into the AFCFTA, considering that what we have been talking about seems to favor big businesses more. And uh, more Africans do not trade among themselves when it comes to SMEs. I would stress technology. I mean, the, the, uh, the use of technology is going to be a big advantage for small businesses. And, uh, and not be afraid of collaboration and subcontract. I think to grow businesses, you need to build relationships and you need to actually have a spirit of collaboration. I keep stressing this collaboration because sometimes we have this notion that it happens, I mean, without work. You need to actually get to know yourselves better. You need to find the value chain area that you have a comparative advantage in. And I stress the use of technology. That will be the game changer for small businesses. Just quickly also, I would want you to talk about the issue of trust. A lot of Africans do not trust themselves because they just feel that, I mean, <laughs> there could be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, abuse of trust and all of that. How do you think Africans can trust themselves very quickly? We trusted ourselves. I use the word collaboration because I did not want to use trust because it's a myth. We've traded over the centuries and we had trust. 
We also had very clear rules of engagement in terms of long-term relationships. We, we, we don't really suffer from trust. I think one thing which we lack is a vehicle for stronger collaboration. Because if the benefits are on both sides, you will build trust over the relationship that you build. Because you can't walk into, I, I don't know, I mean, a, a popular uh, supermarket in Ghana is uh, Malcolm. You can't go into Malcolm and ask that you want to buy trust. You slowly build trust, and it's through the collaboration and relationships that will get us going. As we try to round off this conversation, how can smaller businesses, MSMEs, tap into this? Because it's big businesses that do a lot of cross-border <laughs> trading and, 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 and all women of businesses that. As Only well. very yes. few smaller businesses yes. do. The thing is this, well, trust has to be earned in business. Now, the, the thing about the small business, uh, there's something that Nigerian Central Bank has done, which I have presented to ECOWAS, and they're all asking questions, how, why? See, they use what they could, they do in Anchor Borrowers Program, which is got over four million farmers in four million hectares, one farmer, one hectare. And then they're giving them the funding that they require, but with an anchor. An anchor is the off-taker. And it could be a processor, it could be an exporter, it could be a retail chain. But they are the ones organizing the chain. And these people, these four million farmers do not have to bring any collateral. Their collateral is their, their, their biometric bank verification number. And that has worked because Finish. we have that seen some it. farmers actually no, abusing that, that you know, trust. No, but the thing is, but, but the thing is, let me tell you the <laughs> it, advantage. It, it's more successful. Of, no, no, than no. Those who have defaulted. What you are doing is that you are converting subsistence farmers into commercial farmers because you are sending them the seeds or seedlings. You're sending them the correct uh, fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides, and aggregating the produce all, all and right. linking them to <laughs> national, regional, and international supply all, chain. All right. That Thank is a so game much, changer bro. for small people. You get them all, in. All right. Well, uh, it's good to know that ECOWAS is uh, thinking towards that line and taking those kind of uh, suggestions from you. Professor Ken Ife, a macroeconomist, it's been nice having you right here. And then we also have our guest uh, from Accra, um, Mr. Boateng. It was really nice having you on the show. You're still watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead, including Georgia runoff, high stakes to decide control of U.S. Senate. Stay with us.